We're excited to announce that our very own podcasting platform, Zencaster, has become a new sponsor to the show. Check out the podcast discount link in our show notes and stay tuned for why we love using Zen for the podcast. You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Welcome to episode, hold on, 18. 18. Thank you. Episode 18 of Archaeo Animals, uh, the podcast all about zoo archaeology. I'm Alex Fitzpatrick and with me as always, Simona Falanga. And today we will be talking about llamas and alpacas, uh, our favorite South American camelids. This is a completely different episode. Uh, I mean, it's kind of similar to um, an episode we did very previously about um, pack animals. But I mean, again, this is kind of way out of our jurisdiction in terms of region. Oh, it's definitely a bit out of our comfort zone, but I thought it'd be something interesting to cover because, of course, it's a, a, not a geographical region that um, necessarily, you know, we know too much about but it's great one because we learn to get more about it to do an episode about it and you get to learn more about it especially as llamas and alpacas are sort of all over the place on the internet and pop culture because they've had this extreme surge in popularity and it'll be great to know about the origins of these species and how crucial they are actually in the economy of a lot of south american cultures yeah, let's preface this by saying that before we started recording, I was introduced to the llama song, which I'd never heard of before. Apparently, this was like this is a big thing that uh, future digital archaeologists will find about our own cultures. This is this is like the same level of like badger, badger, badger. And I see, I like, know that. Yeah, yeah, and then like, oh, what are the other ones? There's uh, like, uh, you, you remember the llamas, Carl? And oh, what was the other llama called? You know the, the, oh, the llamas, llamas in hats. Yeah, llamas in hats. Um, no idea. Uh, yeah. This is gone. Does the magical like pluridon mean anything to you? Absolutely not. Oh, but that's Charlie yeah. the unicorn. I know, but it's like the same time period, similar. It's like the same. It's contextually like similar. I was all about oh. the badgers. I did not really care for the llamas, and today we are rectifying that. <laughs> but yes, it, it's like the badger song, but in the noughties. <sighs> Yeah. Y'all are weird. <laughs> anyway, South American yeah. Camelid Taxonomy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so a very interesting episode we've got for y'all today, uh, especially because I don't think Simona can talk about Rome in this one. I'm, I'm, I'm sure I can find a way. We'll figure it out, yeah. Absin- uh, absence of evidence is an evidence of absence. So there valid. may or may not have been camelids. <laughs> well, they were definitely like straight up camels, but there might have been llamas in yeah. Roman Britain. Let's find out. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you want to introduce us? Because I believe this episode was uh, your brainchild, Simona. <laughs> <laughs> taxonomically speaking what's sort of interesting about covering llamas and alpacas is that again it's a bit different um compared to the most most of the domesticates we've covered not just because they come from an entirely different geographical region but also because uh unlike many of the domesticates we've covered the wild ancestors are still alive and kicking so i guess starting off like well no need to describe a llama. I think everyone's seen a llama in, in, in a photo or somewhere. They're, they're big, fuzzy camelids. They're lovely. Um, the, the the llama, the scientific name is Llama Glama, uh, mm. is supposed to have been uh, domesticated. What? Sorry, sorry. The scientific name is what? It's Llama Glama. Llama Glama. Oh, oh they get It's better. extremely good. They get oh better. Um, it's really good. Who <laughs> named it? A genius, someone who deserves the Nobel Peace Prize, or a Pulitzer at least. And I should call this Lama Glama. Lama Glama. I love it. But yes, the the, <laughs> the llamas are believed to have be, to be the domesticated form of the guanaco. Now, though that's the most uh, accepted theory. It is a bit difficult to ascertain in places because modern llamas have been shown to be incredibly hybridized with alpacas. 
Yeah. And I've been for a fair few centuries now. And of course, the alpaca, while very similar to the llama, it's like a mini llama with nicer fur, uh, <laughs> they <laughs> descend from a different wild cabalid called vicuña. Yeah, so the, <laughs> the alpaca, whose uh, scientific name is the vicuña pacos, is, as we said, smaller than the llamas. And the two can indeed crossbred, crossbreed and have been crossbred intentionally for a few centuries now. And uh, it descends from the vicuña, whose scientific name is unsurprisingly vicuña vicuña. Scientific names are so interesting. <laughs> Glama, glama. But my favorite, my favorite is still like the Wolverine. It's like gulo gulo. It's like gluttonous, gluttonous. It's beautiful. It's so cool. But yeah, um, I think the best way to kind of start off about talking about the zoo archaeological, uh, you know, importance of these camelids is probably to do what we always do, which is talk about domestication. And how Ooh. and how nobody really knows. We got a fairly informed opinion, but not really. <laughs> also, want to uh, preface this whole episode by saying apologies for uh, bad pronunciation of things. Again, this is very much out of kind of our specialities in terms of regions. So, <laughs> yeah, doing our best. That's the whole thing. <laughs> Anyway, so I think llamas and uh, alpacas are mostly associated with, uh, as we said earlier in the episode, South America, the Andes especially. So uh, the first evidence of domestication of these camelids was in the Puna region of the Peruvian Andes, which was just up to 6,000 years of uh, activities, which were mostly hunting of these creatures. And then eventually you start seeing domestication, which is a pretty similar pattern that we see even here with domesticates in uh, Britain. Oh, yeah, you, you would have had your hunter-gatherer cultures that would have mainly sort of hunted the guanacos and the vicuña, and uh, then slowly sort of maybe like coral them and... Just domesticate them and slowly becoming more and more pivotal to the economy of these cultures as they shifted from hunter gathering to herding and agriculture. Mm -hmm. And of course, the, the markers that have been used to determine sort of where when this domestication occurred, which is supposed to have been sort of finalized around like 5,000 years ago, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. And you see, of course, you see morpho morphological changes in the skeleton. I think one of the main markers is actually uh, changes in dental morphology. Uh, and of course, other markers for it as for any other domesticates is the increased frequency in the archaeological record and um, most importantly the presence of neonatal and fetal remains was suggested that the animals were bred on site yeah no exactly and again it's i like i do like seeing having these episodes to talk about uh these patterns that are pretty much ubiquitous in terms of you know, domestication of certain animals uh, over time, over different regions. Um, you know, I think that's it's an, kind of a nice thing to just to see that, how that all kind of connects, if that makes sense. Well, because it is, because the, um, I can't think of the word exactly, but so the, the thought process it is the same across humanity. Mm -hmm. So you see that, like, regardless of um, geographical area and time period, you see sort of, very similar processes taking place. And that is, uh, that also includes the, I like that animal. It's fuzzy and cute. I'm going to keep it. <laughs> Common it's across the as, world. <laughs> yeah, no, it's good of a reason as any. And, you know, you don't really see that reason talked about in textbooks, which is, you but know. It's cute. I'm going to keep it. <laughs> it's completely valid. Just saying, and especially when we're talking about llamas and alpacas, which are extremely cute. And of course, still around today. So well, one thing that was un interesting in terms of researching for this episode is actually, I figured, I knew uh, that they were used for wool, even to today. I didn't know they were also still kept for meat, which is actually really interesting and would actually kind of love to have like a, a llama jerky. Just saying. Um, Alex, I'm just checking in. Have you eaten before the episode today? No, I haven't. Ah, we got to food again. I guess it must be an Archie Animals episode. 
to be fair, you can't really talk about animals in the archaeological record without talking about food. Just putting it out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that, that is very true, but... Oh, dear. <laughs> See, I'm gone for one episode, and you're just back to your old tricks. Oh, we forgot to mention, by the way, the disembodied voice that pops up from now to time to time, in case you had not heard it before, it is our producer, Tristan. So say hello to Tristan, everyone. Yeah, who was not here for our last episode, which was uh, made sense because we were all happy and joyous and celebrating the holidays. But now he's back, so, you know. <laughs> ah, well, I know whose audio is going to get muted <laughs> in the next episode. Fair enough. Anyway, getting back on track, talking about our, our, our cute and friendly alpacas and llamas who are, are traditionally still kept for meat and wool, uh, even today. And um, I think the more common uh, use of alpacas and llamas, especially if someone who is from the States, uh, is seeing them more in like leisurely activities. So your petting zoos, your llama walks. Uh, I'm pretty sure one of my cousins keeps alpacas back in New York. <laughs> Because that they have had a, an enormous surge in popularity, so like the animals, you know, they've 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 been sort of worldwide for a while now, but even more so in recent years, when like sort of act leisurely mm. activities like you know, llama walks and that sort of stuff are starting to really take off. Um, and notably, at least like I, I know in the UK and I'm sure in many other places as well, the males are also used as a guard dog of sort for livestock which i've actually i think i've seen before like videos of that and i i guess i didn't make the the uh like thought that like oh yeah they would be used as guard dogs like i guess that makes sense because i think you have the one male i can't remember if neutered or un unneutered can't remember which of the two but you do sort of keep the one and the sheep do tend to follow it and the llama does get quite protective of the sheep and will actually look after them yeah, the llama's like just a big sheep with a, with a big neck. Well, in a way, like it has served uh, m many of the same purposes in South America that the sheep has served. No, I'm saying that scientifically. You can all quote me in your papers and stuff. Llama is just big sheep. Alex Fitzpatrick, PhD candidate. No, you don't even need to credit her. She'll just give that to you because she's nice like that. Um, yes, I'm the nicest person, the nicest <laughs> podcaster around, truly. But yeah, no, so they are used as like as um, guards for livestock, and I think it's just more and more people are keeping llamas and alpacas. I believe some probably even as pets if they got a large enough garden. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> or, or perhaps. Very well known fact, or little known fact, alpacas and llamas are actually quite difficult to train. So it's actually recommended usually from breeders that if you've never owned one of these two species before, that you get an adult and don't get persuaded to get a younger one, because they're actually quite difficult to train. So if they're not being sort of trained by a professional and handled from a young age, you're really going to struggle. I can imagine, definitely. Actually, uh, when I was researching for this episode, I, I looked up differences between alpacas and llamas, which we'll get to later on in the episode. And one of the first Google, like related Google searches was, uh, who's nicer, alpacas or llamas? And if you want to know the answer, apparently uh, they're both gentle. Uh, alpacas are known to be more timid and would stay more in their herds, which is why llamas are more often used as uh, like quote unquote guard dogs and uh llamas are usually quite gentle but uh if you mistreat it or uh give it too much to carry like overburden it uh it will spit and or kick at you which sounds like me so you know big mood <laughs> attend careful may spit <laughs> may spit may kick it may also not move uh, and i was like one of the other things I was like it, it may not it'll just lay down i'm like oh man me hashtag me that's me <laughs> but I think in terms of um, products, I think like one of the main sort of products that to this day we still get from alpacas and llamas is the fleece. Mm -hmm. Where, of course, the nicer quality one is found on alpacas and is actually comparable to cashmere, which is also a very sort of premium fleece that's uh, from the cashmere goat. Yeah. I believe. Because the, in the llama, the fleece is not as good quality, but you get more of it, which mm -hmm. incidentally is why the two species have been hybridized so much. 
so that you'd get more fleece, but of higher quality. Ah, uh, yeah, that would make sense. And actually, that leads really nicely into kind of talking a bit more about the differences between alpacas and llamas. Because, I mean, if you look at like a picture of the two of them, they, they do pretty much look almost the same. Uh, I don't think I could really tell the difference, at least with living alpacas and llamas, you know. But there's like some like main differences, like Sabona just said, the differences in types of hair is uh, a big uh, indicator. There's also size. Al- alpacas are smaller than llamas, and that's something we'll get into a bit later on. We talk more about the uh, skeletal differences between them, and uh, actually the face shape. Which I only once I read it, I was like, "Oh yeah, of course." So alpacas have these smaller, more blunt faces with small ears, and llamas have these more elongated, longer faces. And this is a phrase I saw multiple times. Banana shaped ears, which is very delightful. Makes sense. I mean, yeah, they do have banana shaped ears. <laughs> I'll trust you on that. But like, I, I think it's a good thing to kind of at least point out that there is a lot of similarities as well in terms of like the way they look, which will lead on to kind of how they actually are quite similar skeletally. Skeletally? Clearly, as well, which probably can end up for uh, some difficulties when it comes to being a zooarchaeologist looking at these kind of assemblages, which is why I'm glad it's not me, because I would probably have a hard time. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing to say to that. <laughs> no. I mean, that's fair. And I guess that means we should probably take a break before we go on to the next segment. Chris Webster here for the Archaeology Podcast Network. We strive for high quality interviews and content so you can find information on any topic in archaeology from around the world. One way we do that is by recording interviews with our hosts and guests located in many parts of the world all at once. We do that through the use of Zencaster. That's Z-E-N-C-A-S-T-R. Zencaster allows us to record high quality audio with no stress on the guest. Just send them a link to click on and that's it. Zencaster does the rest. They even do automatic transcriptions. Check out the link in the show notes for 30% off your first three months or go to Z-E-N-C-A-S-T-R dot com and use the code ANIMALS. Looking to expand your knowledge of x-rays and imaging in the archaeology field? Then check out An Introduction to Paleo Radiography, a short online course offering professional training for archaeologists and affiliated disciplines. Created by archaeologist, radiographer, and lecturer James Elliott, the content of this course is based upon his research and teaching experience in higher education. It is approved by the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists as four hours of training. That's in the UK, for those of you that don't know. So don't miss out on this exciting opportunity for professional and personal development. For more information on pricing and course structure, visit paleoimaging.com. That's P-A-L-E-O imaging.com. And look for the link in the show notes to this episode. And we are back with Archaeo Animals. Uh, today we are talking about South American camelids, specifically llamas and alpacas. And now we'll be talking a bit more about the skeletal remains bits. skeletal the bits it's probably a better way to say that <laughs> the, the, the bony bits the bony bits eh, yeah the bony bits not the soft squishy bits the bony bits no 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 please uh, no squishy bits <laughs> absolutely not never never squishy bits <laughs> so yeah i guess kind of like i said we, we did kind of talk about camelids in a previous episode uh when we did talk about literally camels. But, you know, we still want to kind of talk about how we identify these remains in the archaeological record. And as always, because I'm uh, one of the worst zoo archaeologists of all time, I like to start off by talking about the things that you can mix up uh, these remains with, because (laughs) it's something that I do all the time. So again, with camelids, I would say that you're seeing bones that have some similarities with equine kind of remains, especially when you come to the fragmented pieces. I mean, the skulls, especially when we're talking about llamas and alpacas, are actually quite different. But if you got like only bits and pieces of it, you're going to get confused. So, you know, always uh, look for those elongated angular shapes of like the nasal bit of the skull, because that is very significant to llamas and alpacas. We'll put some pictures in the show notes, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. They are very strange looking and very distinct. Oh, they are, yeah. 
And I guess, but then the once you've identified your skeletal remains as um, a camelid, 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 the issue is: is it a llama or is it an alpaca? And so we we know alpacas are smaller, but then of course, especially because as we've mentioned before, the two species have been hybridized so much. It can be a bit of a pickle to tell them apart, depending on how like sort of how much. Those remains were like hybridized or just a straight up llama or straight up alpaca, which apparently has not really been a thing for a while now. Mm-hmm. But I guess one thing you could look at, because if you see some um, camelid remains that are quite small, perhaps hopefully if you get um, sort of cranial fragments or like a jaw or a maxilla, you can look at dentition and tooth eruptions, because chances are maybe if it's got yeah. um, deciduous dentition and it's quite small, maybe it's a, it's a baby llama and not an alpaca. Or it could also be a baby, a yeah. baby alpaca, I guess. Um. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it's. It feels like when I was reading a bit more about the issues with differentiating between llamas and alpacas in the archaeological record, I feel like there's a very similar issue that we've got with, say, you know, goats and sheep as well. <laughs> I wonder if some uh, zoo archaeologists who work in South American regions kind of just do the like llama slash alpaca because that's definitely me with goats and sheep. <laughs> Lapaca. La- Lapakian, Lapakian skeletal remains. Unidentified. <laughs> this is why I don't work in South America. I guess one thing that's quite uh, distinct in camelids, like a uh, camp, oh, camelid, oh dear, is um, that they've got a bit of um, sexual dimorphism. So it's actually, is it the premolars mm-hmm. that are tusk like in males? I think so. I, I know that they are seen as tusk-like and I, I know that's like the shorthand you learn when it comes to differentiating the two or at least that's what i've heard before i think that it is uh sexual dimorphism though because i'm not sure whether they'll count as a premolar or a canine a bit like you've got the wolf tooth in horses that is predominantly found in males mm. so i wonder whether there's a similar thing going with llamas where it is generally found in males but you can also find it on a female yeah, maybe. Because that is a hmm, case in horse, be... like a wolf teeth, are usually indicative of male, but yeah. not necessarily. Animal bones are so confusing. <laughs> they, why can't they be so easy? Of course, last but, but not least, there, there is an, um, something about feet. Yeah, I, it's something that I always forget. You know, camelids are two-toed, which means they, they're not just hooves that you see like with horses, which, honest to God, I will just kind of assume <laughs> that they all have hooves. So I'm just going to look up llama feet. I feel like that might give you some stuff that you don't want to see. Uh, it didn't actually. Shocking. <laughs> I'm just wondering, um, with regards to like two-toed feet, is it like a split in the middle? Like like a trotter? Like a pig's trotter? Or is it like, how is it two-toed? Like, well, how does it actually look? Since Simona, you have your image. Yeah, it, it is split. It is split in the middle, so it's, it's two toes. So it looks very much like hoofed animals, but it's actual toes. To be fair, with like the, the quite chunky nails, which may as well be like yeah, hooves. that's fair <laughs> for all intents and purposes. I guess because they don't go all the way, so it is just in a way they, they remind me a bit of the canines in boars. Yeah, no, I I, I can see that. So they're this big, chunky bits of keratin. But uh, it's not a hoof that goes all the way around. Yeah, it two is two toes. toes. But I feel like, like you said, because sometimes they're so chunky, you can just immediately, like, your brain will think, like, oh, those are hooves. I think that's something that I definitely do all the time. It's a just a very, very chunky paw in, in good need of a pedicure. Love them. Chunky paws. We are pro chunky paws here at Archaeo Animals. Let me tell you, <laughs> they are so in this like this year height of fashion. Height of fashion. I've been pulling it off for twenty six years. Hashtag <laughs> chunky paws. Hashtag chunky toes. Chunky toes. Actually, please don't. Please don't. Ask, please don't make that hashtag. Please, God, don't. <laughs> we don't. We don't <laughs> approve of that. <laughs> Let's move. Let's move. Let's, um, okay, uh, we're no. moving away from feet as as soon as possible. Um, <laughs> let's bring it back to Tees because uh, there's a note on our, our show notes that Simona wrote that just says "fighting teeth," 
And I didn't look more into it because I wanted her to explain to me. No, that is the same exact is thing. Is it the we've tough life thing? Okay, yeah. Yes. But why is it called fighting tears? Yes. Um, because I believe it's a bit of sexual dimorphism. So like it's for the males to fight amongst each other. Oh, I'm actually really sad. I was hoping it was like a, a really interesting like explanation of like, I don't know. I assume maybe they like they they like bared their teeth and like fought. And I was excited to get that explanation. No. I ruined it. It's just uh very much like antler on deer and uh the big tusks on munjack deer and whatnot. Yeah. You can't just call that fighting teeth. That sounds too exciting. Well maybe it is exciting for the llamas and the alpacas. Eh, I guess. You so. don't know them. You've not talked to them. Don't judge them. I I would absolutely never Judge a fellow chunky toe. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Oh, what have I this done? Is, this this is the worst episode we've ever made by far. <sighs> well, let's let's get maybe let's move away from the anatomical stuff and get to uh, the more theoretical type cultural stuff about llamas and alpacas because of course as anyone who listens to our show knows even though i love to talk about food it's not just about food it's more than that there's so many other things that uh these animals were used for in the past and that's obviously true for alpacas and llamas uh a lot of it we've already talked about um as we said they're kept mainly for fleece and uh, for meat, llamas were also used as beasts of burden. Um, for more about that, I uh, recommend you go and listen to our Desert Pack Animals episode if you haven't listened to that, just saying. Um, uh, alpacas, not so much, I guess, because they're a bit smaller. You wouldn't necessarily use them as uh, a beast of burden, uh, which fair enough. You would, you would, you'd also ruin their beautiful fur. True. I mean, yeah, you want to keep that fur. Not those llamas. They've got coarse hair. No one wants that. Take that, llamas. Listen, actually, another byproduct of the fleece is also like the fleece would also be used to craft a string used in basketry. Oh, that's mm-hmm. actually, huh. I'm trying to imagine now, like a, a basket made out of um, their wool. That's actually really interesting. Yep. Just, just string made out of. Please. I want a llama basket. (laughs) Um, From a cultural and uh, sort of a ritualistic perspective. There's that word, ritual. Oh, it's going to... Everyone, either one of us is going to drop the R word in every episode. Everything is ritual. Everything is ritual. We should just change the name of our podcast. Everything is ritual, the podcast. Also about nah, I, th- I think that joke's gone a bit old by now. <laughs> no, it's my that joke is my entire PhD. Don't make fun of it. Hey. <laughs> so llamas and alpacas also feature prominently in uh, sort of a so sort of the religious and uh, spiritual sphere of a lot of South American cultures. Notably, both llamas and alpacas are part of a sacrificial well were part of a sacrifical rite of uh, specifically uh, the Chiribaya culture sites, uh, one of those being El Yeral. And on this site, it's actually quite interesting. They found a lot of naturally mummified llamas and alpacas beneath, uh, found beneath house floors, so like as a foundation deposit. Which is really interesting because, again, uh, very similar to stuff that we find here in uh, Britain in terms of uh, animals being uh, foundational deposits. And it's really interesting to see the ubiquitous of that kind of concept. Something interesting about also um, llamas and alpacas, they were sacrificed, is that according to the Spanish written record, the animals were actually bred to have some specifically coloured fur that would be designed sort of more apt for certain sacrifical rites. Hmm. Yeah, that is also really interesting. I do also wonder how much, if there, if this is mainly from Spanish written records, um, how much of that is also accurate? Not much of it, most likely. <laughs> Probably not. Yeah, I, 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 that was something uh, that was actually really interesting in researching for this episode is how a lot of it comes from, a lot of these concepts come from Spanish record records, uh, you know, because they obviously went and uh, 
conquered a lot of these uh, South American nations. Uh, so it, it's kind of interesting to see like the, the colonialism also coming into this discussion of like, you know, how much of this is just, you know, assumptions made by other people. Assumptions like either intentionally or unintentionally made, because we see a similar thing. You see, I'm bringing it to the Romans. Woo, I'm doing we it. Did it. We see, well, we see something Everything similar. Everything is Roman. Because <laughs> when we look at Iron Age cultures in Britain, we do have a fair amount of information that comes from Roman records. But now, of course, how much of that is accurate? Mm-hmm. For example, a lot of things that the Romans would write about, uh, I don't know, Iron Age cultures uh, making human sacrifices, which to an extent may well be true, but how much of it was the Romans conquering some populations and wanting to purposely paint them in a bad light to justify that conquest? Yeah, so a lot of this, I mean, there were some things I saw when I was researching that were literally the only citation was Spanish, like during the Spanish conquest, uh, Spanish uh, folks like noted that blah, 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 blah. And it was like, I don't know if I should really add that to our conversation because like, I'm not 100% sure on that, obviously. Which I guess is why we have archaeology to kind of hopefully fill in those gaps when we can. And then match it to the written record. So I guess, uh, uh, well, not match it, but you know what I mean. So that you have a written record that you can base some some preliminary research on. But of course, like, bear in mind, pinch of salt, pinch of salt. Because there is bias left, right and centre. And then if you can find the evidence to match that, brilliant. If not, eh. Eh. Yeah, so it's not just these like Spanish written records that we have uh, information from as well, of course. In ritual art, like votive figurines, things like that, we see that alpacas and llamas have been represented in ways that seem like they were a part of these kind of uh, religious rituals and rites. Uh, For example, alpacas apparently were seen by Andean people as gifts from the goddess uh, Pachamama. There's also the Mochi people of Peru who would often place these uh, votive figurines of llamas in human burials. So you at least have that kind of, you know, um, actual material evidence to see, like, whether or not we know exactly how they factored into their uh, religious beliefs. Um, they were at least a factor, as, as sure. um, Well, not as a species, but it's two species, but they were vital parts of the economies of a lot of these cultures. So, of course, you, you'd think that they would hold mm-hmm. an important place in the religious sphere as well, because these animals are your substance for the most part. Or your, exactly, or yeah. your, subs- your, your livelihood, at least. Not, not substance necessarily, but... Speaking of livelihood, I mean, as we said before, llamas were also used as uh, beasts of burden. So they definitely also played an important part in trade at the time. And that they were probably the reason why trade networks expanded as much as they did um, with this concept of like caravans of llamas. And even as we mentioned before with the Spanish conquest, um, after the Spanish conquest, uh, the Spaniards apparently used to use llamas to carry ore back and forth from the mines. So it's that kind of extension of that use, uh, even as you see those like cultural shifts. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They carried a lot of stuff. That's basically what you need to know. Lots of carrying. Good on the llamas. You troopers. Mm, Yeah. But as we know, of course, you can't put too much stuff on them or they will spit and or kick. (laughs) Like yours truly, Alex Fitzpatrick. (laughs) Oh no. Ruminate on that uh, (laughs) as we take a break. And we <laughs> let, 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 let's take a think break. Of, and think yeah, about don't what burden me, or I will spit and or kick you. We'll be back with case studies in the next segment. You may have heard my pitch for membership. It's a great idea and really helps out. However, you can also support us by picking up a fun T-shirt, sticker, or something from a large selection of items from our T Public store. Head over to arcpodnet.com slash shop for a link. That's arcpodnet.com slash shop to pick up some fun swag and support the show. 
And we are back again with Archaeo Animals. We are talking about camelids from South America, specifically our adorable friends, the llamas and the alpacas. And now we are at everyone's favorite part of the podcast, which is case studies, where we talk about other people's research, because this is very much out of our jurisdiction. Because we have none of our own, or I don't Absolutely. anyway. <laughs> I definitely don't anymore. I'm a PhD student. I have one research. <laughs> That's it these days. That's still one research more than I have. Oh. But hey, you know, we at least we get to learn more uh, from other people's research. And that's all that matters. It's all about the learning. Learning is great. <laughs> I don't know why that came out sarcastically. I do genuinely believe it. Learning is great. Yeah, sorry. We are pro-learning here at Argo Animals. But yeah, so the first um, thing that we've come across is the, well, the llama face shoe. <laughs> yeah. That was... First of all, what a title. <laughs> I saw that title and was like, immediately I need to know more. I have never seen anyone refer to an archaeological find as Lama Face Do. This may be the first time, I think. Yes, yeah, so like it's actually it's an article um, that I came across on Forbes written by, by archaeologist uh, Christina Kilgrove. She, I was going to say friend of the show, but she's not. I just <laughs> have mutual friends with her. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would hope she is the friend of the show. Um, if you hear this, <laughs> will, like yeah, a will you be my friend? Yes, no. <laughs> hashtag Kilgrove friend of the show. I don't know. I'm not very good at this hashtag thing. No, please, please refrain. <laughs> <laughs> but the article sort of uh, discusses the discovery discovery made by archaeologist Guy Duke from the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley, and who subsequently published this research on the Cambridge Archaeological Journal. So the discovery or the unearthing uh, took place on um, uh, the site of Huasihuachuma, which dates between 600 and 850 AD. And now, similarly to the naturally mummified llamas underneath the floorboards of a house that we were discussing in the previous segment, this also involves some llama remains still underneath the floor surface of a dwelling, uh, but this time in the form of a, a scattered of remains in a pot. Now, the vessel, the um, typology was sort of looked at and it was found to be consistent with period cooking pots. So, like, nothing particularly extravagant about it or anything. It's just a fairly ordinary cooking pot. And based on the residue analysis, it had been used before. It was not something that had been crafted specifically for the deposition. And inside, there was a just an explosion of animal. <laughs> <laughs> of animal. Is that what they wrote in the actual um, academic paper? An explosion. <laughs> Figure one, an explosion of animals. Absolutely, yes, they're quoting an explosion of animal remains. But not only animal remains, there was a, um, a lot of organic remains in there. So you had uh, a substantial amount of animal remains. Uh, there was a fair amount of... Um, llama remains and i'm presuming facial sort of like cranial bones were included hence the title um <laughs> Space and, uh, and guinea pig remains as well but that wasn't all because together um with the animal remains you also had uh, remains of uh, potato chili peppers squash maize uh beans crabs flathead mullet and the plant coca it was a, a fairly rich mm. stew. Sounds great, to be honest. Like, I'm here for that face stew. If anyone else wants to make it, oh send God. it my way. Uh, <laughs> need to eat before, after the show. Before the show. After the show. <sighs> maybe, maybe someone will make you llama face chili. Yay. <laughs> Experience that. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> an interesting thing that they've... Um, that he's done. So, like, he, they've looked at so these ingredients and they've cross checked them with the records that we already have for recipes that would have been made by this culture around this time, but it didn't really fit any of the recipes that we're aware of. One thing. Hmm. And, um, of course, you know, it raises some very interesting question because was this just 
a recipe, just one that we're not aware of before, where all these ingredients are mixed together, or were these ingredients specifically chosen because they had a particular supernatural significance? Because we know we have an idea now about so the role that llamas played in the spiritual sphere. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mesa, I believe, also has some ritual connotations in some South American cultures. So, you know, it could it could be a, a ritualistic meal or it could also be a very ordinary meal. But I mean, one thing we do know is that foundation deposits, no matter in what time period to take place or where in the world to take place, they do tend to have some very heavy ritualistic connotations. So the, the position of this vessel with the sort of plant and uh, animal remains inside was purposeful and he must have had some sort of ritualistic meaning behind it from the, the inauguration of a dwelling or you you name it. And one thing that will also be interesting to look at as well is that where these um, was this material deposited all at once or was it maybe over a period of time mm-hmm. where material was kept, like was being added to this vessel? Yeah, no. And that's something actually I've recently been finding really interesting. Uh, I can't really go into it on this podcast because it's uh upcoming research that is being done right now. But uh, let's just say that I've come across a a deposition that has a lot of weird time stuff going on there. So the concept of like these long term depositions is really interesting to me. And this idea of like, especially in this case, let's say, if it was uh, a deposition that had been taking place over a period of time, that you would have to make this kind of uh, ritual activity of, you know, under, uncovering the foundations, picking it up, finding this thing, adding to it, uh, recovering it, stuff like that, um, which is like super interesting and is it's just interesting to think of as its own religious activity as well. Of course, from the from a stratigraphic point of view, you have to see sort of how long this process would have taken. Then again, I'm saying this without knowing anything yeah. about how what, what dwellings would have looked like in this geographical area and in this time period. But normally if you sort of deposit something in the ground and you backfill it or you just leave it be, um, usually when you go back to it to add something else, you do normally see that stratigraphically, mm-hmm. sort of like you disturbing that soil. But then, of course, it, it very much depends on environmental and anthropogenic factors. So if, if it happened in the space of like five, ten years, it might be that stuff was added to that pot continuously over, say, a five-year period, and you wouldn't necessarily notice anything stratigraphically. Exactly, yeah. To be honest, I'm not entirely sure where I'm getting it, because it's quite different from what I normally deal with. No, I mean, it's uh, it's a very weird question that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking of, again, as it kind of relates to my own research right now. And the idea of kind of these, ide- like the concept of time as it passes, how, like you said, you know, if you have a five year difference between uh, depositions, it's not necessarily something that is going to be seen as significantly as a uh, time period of, you know, hundreds or thousands of years. I know, well, it will still be sig- significant. I just think that sort of stratigraphically will be because if it, um, if you've added, uh, well, because then I guess it depends on with uh, what frequency you add stuff to it because it's based on so many factors that just it'll be really interesting to see sort of what the results are. Yeah, no, uh, and how you, and how you go about proving it. Exactly. No, it's it's just kind of the t- temporal thing I find in- interesting. But, you know, now you understand why I'm stressed out all the time for the past couple of weeks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you have no idea. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's super interesting. I'm also very interested in the idea that it's specifically face bits. <laughs> yep. Because, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I know that there are uh, food uh, like recipes that call for those kind of bits. Uh, I'm not just I'm not speaking specifically for llamas, but generally speaking, there are dishes that specifically use like those bits. But it's interesting to think of in terms of if it was just like a recipe, you know. 
I mean, it, it, it could be just be a recipe that they had. Yeah. I mean, it's just not commonly like, I mean, again, we're speaking from a completely different region and completely different time periods uh, that we work in. But, um, you know, like if you're finding uh, ritual feasty type stuff uh, over here, you know, you're normally finding the big meaty bits for sure. Unless like something that doesn't bear as much meat is seen as a delicacy. Exactly. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> we're just wrapping our minds in knots in this episode. Don't we always? As we always do. Yeah, no, it's true. Especially when it comes to ritual. Now there's a hashtag for you. Presley bits, ritual. No, just like but wrapping our heads in knots. It's a very long hashtag. <laughs> I, I, I am not young anymore. I can't, I can't do hashtags. You're young in your heart. That's all we don't need to know. Bye. But <laughs> <laughs> maybe then let's move a little bit more towards a... Uh, a case study that's a little bit more it's still kind of interesting in terms of like not knowing what's happening entirely but a little bit more i think cut and dry in terms of the ritual stuff um so in modern day bolivia this was a uh somewhat recent article in natural geographic by aaron blakemore uh, uh, archaeologists have found an assemblage of artifacts, animal bones, at the bottom of uh, Lake Titicaca. And uh, apparently it dates back to about 1,200 years ago during the rule of the uh, Tiwanaku state. Uh, so this is pre, uh, I believe this is pre-Spanish conquest at the time. So what makes it kind of interesting is that it is a ritual deposit, and it's not necessarily just a like, oh, this is strange. This is probably a ritual deposit. There were specifically a lot of kind of votive figures uh, that were associated with uh, depictions of deities um, that were found in this deposit. So maybe a little bit more like, yeah, that's probably ritual <laughs> in that case. Um, you also had uh, medallions were found, gold medallions, actually, uh, and some other pieces of gold. Uh, semi-precious uh, gemstones were found, and uh, the animal bones were actually uh, three sacrificed juvenile llamas, uh, which makes me wonder if they are actually, actually llamas or if they're alpacas. Hopefully someone did the the uh, checking over of that. <laughs> yeah, see, now, now I just I question everything. Who knows? <laughs> But it's, it's, it's also another thing that uh, was found in this assemblage is a lot of uh, valuable shells. There's a, a specific type of shell that uh, apparently is from like 1200 miles away. So it was clearly something that was traded to these people, probably valuable. So again, kind of that emphasis on the importance of this deposit. Um, and there are also these metal plates that had uh, depictions of a... Uh, <laughs> what um, was that? Bastet. Oh, <laughs> I thought you were just so excited about uh, llama hybrid creatures because that's what were on these plates. Uh, apparently they were puma llama hybrid uh, mythical creatures, which, um, I mean, the article didn't say if that necessarily correlated to any particular deity or something but again it's very interesting to see the llama being uh, used as like a symbol of these kind of uh, ritual and religious activities so, sorry it's just that she wants to bring her own case study mm -hmm. I, I completely uh, can we can we have uh, just a moment for bass to kind of speak sorry guys you, you're interrupting her and i've been told off myself on my show uh for not properly letting a cat speak I mean, Bath no, makes a good case point. Is, is that she's fabulous, and, and people should appreciate yeah, she her more. Point. She should have her own podcast. But how does she feel about llamas? <laughs> yeah, no, that's valid. That's valid. Bath <laughs> cast. <laughs> yeah, amazing. I hate. I hate to admit it. That's extremely strong. <laughs> um, I I would definitely listen to the Bast cast. It would be great. It's incredibly on brand. <laughs> Hashtag Bass's chunky toes. That is oh, she's going to feel self conscious about her her claws now. They they do need a trim. Oh, all right. I I love like I, I love the wee toe beans. They're so cute. Honestly, cats are great. It, it's a mm. color, like a breed color. It it comes with lilac toe beans. Hmm. Should have lilac <laughs> lavender. 
Okay. Now that's a, now that's a ritual. Yeah, that's I've ever seen one. Lilac fur, which is also Basti's favorite color. By the way, um, I highly suggest people click on the link to uh, that previous case study, which will be in our uh, show notes, because the image of the, uh, the the image of the like puma hybrid creatures and the llama creatures are super cool, and also would love to know how someone kind of figured that out. Because a lot of, especially a lot of the votive figurines of animals, generally speaking, are very abstract in some ways. And there, some people are on just another level of being smart and kind of being able to parse out the different animal types in artwork. I can't do it for sure. That'd be something quite, yeah, that'd be it. <laughs> Sorry, I was, I, was, I was still thinking about the best cast. That's fair. That's completely fair. Um, but yeah, I... Anything else you want to say about llamas? If you can think about it and not about the bass cast. <laughs> she said it for me. Very valid. That's true. But I think uh, the case studies that we picked are pretty good indicators, again, of like how these animals who are so integral to the domesticated lives of these people and uh, you know their economy and trade and everything, how they end up becoming a kind of these important symbols uh, of their cosmologies and belief systems. Uh, and uh, again, I just really am fascinated by face stew. Why isn't that a hashtag? You've definitely got a thing for hashtags this evening. Yeah, hashtag. I think we need more hashtags than that. This is from going onwards. I think the podcast needs more hashtags. So. Hashtag chunky toes. <laughs> Hashtag Bascast. Use the hashtag. Hashtag uh, face Samoa's Romans. Oh, hashtag Samoa's Romans. Hashtag everything is ritual. Yeah. Only like two of those hashtags, by the way, have anything to do with alpacas or llamas. Why are they my Romans anyway? Bonus <laughs> Romans. I don't, I don't have you. ownership over a culture. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I think I think <laughs> I think that is uh, a place. Maybe not the best place, but a place for us to wrap up the show. Um, as always, you know you can find us on Twitter at Archaeo Animals. Uh, we are on the Archaeology Podcast Network website as well. Send us tweets if you want. Use those hashtags. Maybe not the Chunky Toes one, but use the other hashtags. Uh, let us know what you think about the episodes. Be sure to uh, tell your friends uh, that there's a hashtag-based uh, podcast out there that is allegedly teaching people stuff. Uh, but as always, I'm Alex Fitzpatrick. Simona Falang. And uh, yeah, hashtag see you later. Hashtag please eat. Thank you for listening to Archeo Animals. Please subscribe and rate the podcast wherever you get your podcast from. You can find us on Twitter at Archeo Animals. Also, the views expressed on the podcast are those of ourselves, the hosts and guests, and do not necessarily represent those of our institution, employers, and the Archaeology Podcast Network. Thanks for listening. This show is produced and recorded by the Archaeology Podcast Network, Chris Webster and Tristan Boyle in Reno, Nevada at the Reno Collective. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Thanks again for listening to this episode and for supporting the Archaeology Podcast Network. If you want these shows to keep going, consider becoming a member for just $7.99 US dollars a month. That's cheaper than a venti quad eggnog latte. Go to archpodnet.com slash members for more info.